purpose of God on the earth. It's not the scutter of people in its grave, you know, we went over the market, that's awesome. It's the church that demonstrates the wisdom of God to the principalities and powers. And by God's grace, we're going to do it. means we're going to have a shot at the title. Amen. So who's excited about that? Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So, I believe like today's message is going to bless you. And I think this will kind of be like the last one in a series on kind of uh, manifesting, the manifestation of the Spirit of God, part one. And then after next week, we'll go on some things... Uh, Maybe in a, in, a, in a slightly similar direction, but building on that. So, okay, let's kick off in Exodus 33, verse 19. Now, you might know the story. Look at the time, so I'm, I'm aware of time constraints. God said to Moses, Moses said, God, I want to see your glory. And God says, look, I'm going to make all my goodness pass before you and I'll proclaim my name. But he said, my face you cannot see. Okay? Is that a little bit of feedback coming through there? It sounds a little bit. Is there anybody coming out? He says, my face you cannot see. No man can see me and live. Thank God we're not mere men. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're in Christ now. Who's died here? If you're in Christ, you have died. No, I couldn't. Completely go down a rabbit trail here, yeah, but I'll pull back up. So he says, No man can see me and live. And the Lord hid Moses in the cleft of the rock. And you know the rest of the story. Moses kind of had a glimpse of God going past. That must have been phenomenal. But he said, No one can see him. Okay, fast forward to the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died. It's interesting. The name Uzziah means strength. So in the year that strength died, okay, when natural strength gave way, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face. Remember that the angels before the throne of God in Isaiah were covering their face. With two he covered his feet, and with two he put And the crowd which are holy, holy, holy. Okay, but covered their face. Praise God. God is an invisible God. He's an invisible God. Now, let's run over into the New Testament, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. This is an awesome word. I said this, it says this. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. That word mystery, I love that word. It's the word mysterion. And it means secrets. And these are secrets that have been hidden so as to be found by the people of God. Okay, I believe this church has a calling to unpack the mysteries of the kingdom. Things that are hidden for the hidden for us. Okay? And it says, Great is the mystery of godliness, of godlikeness. Great is this mystery, the secret of godlikeness. And it goes on to say what this mystery is. God was manifest in the flesh. Wow! The word became flesh. He was justified in the spirit. That speaks about Jesus' resurrection from the dead. That's a vast subject. He was seen of by angels. But angels hadn't seen God up until this mystery was unpacked. They didn't. They covered the faces. Because he's the invisible God. He dwells in an invisible realm. And in Jesus becoming the Word made flesh, Jesus made God visible. He brought God out of the invisible realm into the visible. And in God was seen by angels. Wow! We kind of had a glimpse of Him. And we've been around Him. But the glory's been so intense. Wow! 
seen of by angels. Wow. Preached to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in the glory. Awesome. Thank you, Lord. So we know that Jesus is the Word made flesh. He manifests. He makes God absolutely real. And he manifests God and he manifests God's glory. John 1 14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, his presence, his importance, his majesty, his power, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. So that was what Jesus did. Jesus manifested the invisible God. And you think, well, how did he do that? John 2 11 says that at this beginning of science, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. One of the chief ways that Jesus manifested the invisible God. So people in the visible, three-dimensional world, whatever, the photo, so that people in this material world could go, wow, there's God. Jesus did that through acts of power, sense of wonder, manifesting the glory of God, bringing the invisible God in a present reality, present tense. Jesus, I mean, we've got new leaflets printed, great leaflets, and it's, it's, there's a value in it, but just having a Christianity where we say, Jesus didn't walk around handing out traps. Okay, that's not manifesting the invisible God, is it? Now, thank God, God used traps in my life. Do not manifest the invisible God. In John 11, 39 and 40, you know the story? When Lazarus is dead, and Jesus says, take away the stone. And people are doubting, and he says, didn't I say to you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God, this glory it's going to come, if you believe, the glory of God from the invisible realm is going to come crashing into the visible world. The glory of God from the immaterial world, the spirit realm, is going to come crashing into this material realm. It's going to manifest glory. That's New Testament Christianity. Thank you, Jesus. You know, this is the hard cry of every true believer. I want to experience God. Man, I don't want to just have word only. You know what I say? I love the word of God. The Bible is the word of God. And oceans of blood have been spilled so that we can have this. But there's something in us like the disciples said. The disciples, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father. Jesus said, when well, this is in uh, John 14, verse 8 and 11, Jesus said, well, Philip, have I not been with you so long? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've seen me, I'm manifesting the Father. If you're seeing me, you're seeing the Father. The Son is manifesting him all the time. And he goes on to say, don't you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me, manifesting himself through me? The words that I speak to you, I don't speak on my own authority. So Jesus manifested God through the words he spoke as well, words of spirit and life. It wasn't just shooting the breeze, it wasn't waffle. It spoke life. Words of spirit and life. Just, you can just put a hand on your mouth and say, I am going to manifest the Spirit of God through my mouth this week. This mouth has been given to me so I can manifest. Wow. He said, don't you believe the words that I'm speaking to you? The carry authority. It's the Father in me that does the works. If you don't believe that, believe for the sake of the works, the miracles themselves. Because I'm, he said, Philip, I manifest the Father. It's like, I'm, I'm like, a, like a volcano. Okay? And everywhere I go, the, the life and the presence 
and the power of the invisible God is just constantly boom, pouring out of me, pouring out of me, pouring out of me in prophetic stuff, words of knowledge, in miracles, in this way, in that way. Isn't that awesome? Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. And you know that's New Testament Christianity, and that's what we have to contend for. It's already been purchased. Okay, and if we believe in this, we've already come too far to settle for religion. Okay? I, I can't settle for religion. And back then, religion, religion was in the day of Jesus, religion is today. You see, the religious will give lip service. You will honour them with their lips, but their hearts are, are far from them. We know that. The religious will kind of say, oh yeah, the word of God, amen. We'll have the word of God, but as soon as God starts to manifest himself through Jesus, they didn't like it. They want to shut it down. The religious says, that manifestation needs to be shut down now. Shut the anointing down. That's the religion, isn't it? That's what anti-Christ means. It means opposing the anointing. You know, we think anti-Christ, the guy coming with horns on his head, there's a lot I can say about that one more there now. But the Bible talks about many anti-Christs, plural, there's many of them. There's some in Leeds, religious, people who are bound by religion, who when the manifestation of God starts to come out, they want to shut it down. They'll have Bible studies, but shut that down. We're not going to let God out of the box. And well, God's not in a box anymore. The, old co the, the Ark of the Covenant's not around. No, but you are the Ark of the Covenant. You are the box. Yeah. Praise God. One of my favorite videos I ever saw, ever. It was the Prophet Corpus in Spirit World South Africa. Somebody made a replica Ark of the Covenant. They the took probably a year making it. This thing cost thousands. It was overlaid with proper gold. And they brought it and they put it in his church. Okay? And so the, he's on the platform and there's a big repli replica of the covenants there. But the Holy Spirit's told him, smash it. <laughs> so he, he, he had us word with one of the guys' church. Can you bring me an axe, please? And in the middle of the message, he took the axe and he started smashing it. Smack, smack, smack. So we don't have that anymore. You are the Ark of the Covenant. You are the Ark of the Covenant. You are the Ark of the Covenant. And the guy who made it never came back to the church. You can't bless him. You know, there was videos put out on YouTube. What a false prophet doing that. You know, how could Hey, we're the Ark of the Covenant. Okay. But it's like there's, there's, there's something around like this that doesn't want it out. We'll have, Bible, we'll have nice little Bible studies and stuff like that. And you know, I love the word when it's living, when it's active. But Jesus said, he said to people in John 5, 36 to 40, he said to the Pharisees, you have never, you've never heard his voice at any time. It's not like, well, you heard his voice once. No, you've never heard his voice once. You've never seen his form. You do not believe. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But these testify of me, the testify of me, the Christ, the anointed one. But you hate the anointed because you want to shut it down. You are not willing to come to me and have life. You're not willing to come to me and have life and get this life in you and love the anointing, love the power of God so the power of God can start exploding out of you and touching other people. I mean, who wouldn't want that? But if you've invested your life in religion, when the truth comes along, it's kind of like, oh, I'm not sure about that because I've given so much time, money and effort to this kind of religion. Then I have to humble myself, admit that, well, no. Praise God. So this is exciting. We're on an exciting course. Let's just read that again from 1 Timothy 3.16. It says, and without controversy, Great is the mystery of godliness, of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up to glory. 
Okay, so the greatest mystery of all is that the invisible God, one circle, explode in our world. That's God's heart. He wants to explode in our world. And so what we're dealing with, we're breaking through all the reason. The UK is full of people who reason, full of people with great ideas but not God ideas, full of reason, full of Okay, God just wants to explore through His people and manifest. Who wants God to manifest through them? Yes. Who wants God to manifest through you? Just put your hand on your, put your hand on your tummy. Say, ah, oh, you know, I've got a river of life in me. I tell you what, it's going to manifest. I am going to manifest. I, the kingdom of God is in me and nobody is locking it up. Amen. It's in here, and the cage, the, the cage is open, <laughs> it's coming out. Whoop. Praise God. How's it coming out? Well, Jesus said in John 20, 21, He says, As the Father sent me, so I send you. So the Father, through the greatest mystery of all, manifested Himself. He sent Jesus so that He could manifest himself and explode into the world through that man. Jesus is saying, I'm sending you exactly the same way so that as a body of Christ, I can explode through you. You're going to be like a fire horse everywhere you go, like a water hydrant. Praise God. And we looked at this scripture recently and uh, Jesus said in John 17, He said, I'm not praying for my disciples alone. I'm praying for everybody who will believe in me through their word. That they may be one, even as we are one. And we'll cover this, what this means in John 10. In John 10 verse 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. I'm one spirit. I and the Father are one. And for that reason, the religious people wanted to throw stones at them. He said, for what, what are you throwing stones at me for? For what miracle, for what work are you throwing stones at me for? Okay? In the same way, he said, the Father sent me, I'm sending you to manifest. I'm sending you to manifest me, to manifest the Spirit, to manifest the Father. And you can only do that when you are one with the Father, the same way I'm one with the Father. And believe me, that is so not an arrogant position, is it? It's so humbling to wake up one morning and think, goodness me, I am a son of God. Hallelujah, I'm a son of God. I'm one with the Father. That is like being taken from the gutter to the palace. Imagine if you lived in the gutter of Calcutta and you smelled poo and you were an absolute, you know, wretch. And a day later, you're in the palace, and you're going to be there for the rest of your life. You're going to wake up every day like, wow, that's what we are in Christ, man. We're one with the Father. And when you live in that, that's when God starts to manifest through you. And you know what? Some people won't like that. They won't like that you're one with the Father. But just love, just bless, be humble. Okay? Praise God. And in that, that's how... We are sent. He goes on to say, we'll cover this. The glory that you you give to me, Father, the glory that you give to me to manifest, I'm giving to them so that they can manifest it. And that I'm praying that they'll be one, perfect in one. I in them, you in me, that we may be made perfect. That means mature, a mature son of God in one, that the world may know that you sent me and I love them as you have loved me. Praise God. So let's just uh, summarize some of this, okay. There is a great mystery, a secret that is hidden to be found. And that mystery, mystery is that God in his glory is made manifest. Okay, he's been justified in the spirit, that's about his resurrection. He's been fully seen by the angelic realm. Okay, 
Praise God. He's been preached under the Gentiles. That means end of all covenant, new covenant. Okay? He has been believed on in the world. Before that time, the world was enemy territory completely. Once Jesus got believed on in the world, once the invisible God through Jesus was believed on in the world, too late, it's game over. Okay? That means the kingdom of God is now unstoppable. The kingdom of God is absolutely unstoppable. Guys, we have to take all of our fear about the future. Okay? We might think, oh, this world we live in, oh, do you know, so the world's so bad these days. Well, who would like to go and live in 1300s? Anybody want to be a tape? Any tape us here to get in a time machine and go and live in the days of the plague? Okay, who wants to be a serf back in like Norman times? Something like that. Anyone? No tape us here. Who's glad to be alive in 2024? I'm excited. It's awesome. The kingdom of God, once he's believed on in the world, devil, game over. He's been believed on in the world. This kingdom is unstoppable. It is absolutely rolling forward, unstoppable. Praise God. Praise God. So, he's been received up in glory, and he's given that glory to us, so that we can be one with the Father, fully mature as sons, that we can manifest him. And only then, and only then, can the world believe that God has sent Jesus. Jesus said, I've given you the glory that you may be one as we are one, that the world believes that I've been sent. Well, if his people are not carrying that glory that's been given, not living in manifested sonship, how on earth is the world going to believe? How on earth can the world believe Unless God's people are walking like Jesus, praise God. It says in Romans 8, 19, I love this verse, it says, The earnest expectation of the creation waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. That's us. It's, it's not that mysterious, really. As the Father sent Jesus to manifest God, to make the invisible God visible, Jesus has sent us to make the invisible God, Jesus, the Father and the Holy Spirit, visible. Okay? Once we start understanding the truth of that, living the truth of our new creation identity, I'm one with the Father, God starts manifesting, wow, through your life. That's it. The, the, the body of Christ begins to manifest God, and the world goes, wow. <laughs> And the created the create order that's in chaos starts becoming blessed. It's the sons of God that are going to restore the earth. We've got to get a different view of the times we're living in and in the times ahead as well. Okay, we are, the church is Christ on earth. Why it says, and I love this scripture, we'll see it again, 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one of us. That means the potential, the capacity to manifest the Spirit of God has been given to us. Now the Spirit of the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, 2 Corinthians 3. So, you can, say, you can tell yourself, I'm going to manifest the Spirit of God, I'm going to manifest the Lord. I'm going to manifest Lordship. We're going to walk in that market and we are going to manifest Lordship. I'm just telling you, just tell yourself this. This is truth. This is truth. I'm going to manifest Lordship. And when I manifest Lordship, I'm going to manifest liberty and every chain is going to be broken. When I manifest the Spirit of the Lord, who is the Lord, chains get broken, sick get healed, demons get cast out. Awesome, awesome, awesome. This is New Testament Christianity. Praise God, praise God. I was going to bring it today, but uh, my little boy has a, a little children's Christian book. And it's really cute. It's all about being like Jesus, but it's about being really kind and sharing your sweets with somebody. And, I mean, I like that sort of stuff. 
Hear my heart, I believe in the fruits of the Spirit being kind. What I think is a little bit more of it than that. Now, I know it's a children's book, but really for many grown up people, well, adult and human age that is, that's the type of Christianity they have, isn't it? It's just like that children's book, but with the kind of an adult type spin to it. You can't call it grown up, because it's not grown up. It's not living as a mature son of God, is it? It's infantile Christianity. And I'm not suggesting for a million years that we leave behind being kind and loving and courteous and all that sort of stuff. So, praise God. And you know what I say, well, where is the God of the Bible? Where is the God of the Bible, man? I've asked myself that in the past, I'm reading this in the Bible. Where are you? What about today? Did this, is this just some history book? Is this a myth? Is this a fairy story? It's not. It's not. Praise God. But well, here's the journey that we are on, right? Hebrews 12 2 says that we have to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You know the rest of the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down. Say set down. Set down. That means Jesus is staying there. Set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is staying there. He ain't moved until Hebrews 10, 10 12 says, For this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for, for sins, forever sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, wait till his enemies are made his footstool. So Jesus is set in place and he sat down and he isn't moving until his enemies are made his footstool. His footstools on the earth. The body of Christ, Ephesians 1 says, is the fullness of him who fills all things. Okay? So where's the feet of Jesus? We, the body, have the feet of Jesus. So Jesus, the head, is set down at the right hand of the Father. And he's staying put until all the enemies, the, all the demons, all the curse, all the stuff that's wrong has been put on his feet. Jesus ain't moved. Praise God. For he must reign, 1 Corinthians 15, 25, till he has put all enemies under his feet. He ain't moving. Praise God. He's not going to get up until certain things have been accomplished. Every enemy must be defeated. That is the job of the body of Christ, which is one with him. Now, to me, that is going to take an absolute miracle for everything that is wrong in the UK to be put right before Jesus ain't going to shift. He sat down and he ain't moving. It's his body's job to do it. That's us. Acts 3.21 says, Heaven has received him until the times of the restoration of all things. All things are going to be restored. Jesus ain't moving until it happens. Now God, through the prophets, in his foreknowledge, saw this. So it is going to happen. I don't know quite how. Well, it is going to be the man when, when the church grows up into the head, into Jesus Christ, and manifests Christ. And when the church becomes Christ on earth, then the church will bring things into subjection to Christ. The church will rule. Then Jesus will get up. And I think, goodness me, there's a long way to go in the United Kingdom. The fact that there's a long way to go in Leeds. If I look at Leeds alone, there's a Lord, we could be here a long time. <laughs> but in His Word, He's seen it. He's seen it, hasn't He? So it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And I tell you what, I think, why am I personally alive on this earth? Why are you alive? I'm alive to play my part. Everything I can by the grace of God to get 
this happening. No playing church, no religion. We have to grow into Christ, but as a few of us are not, a lot of us are not, grown up into Christ to manifest Christ on earth to bring these things into subjection. Praise God. Praise God. So that is the great mystery that God manifested. God was manifest. The other great mystery in the New Testament is Colossians 1.27, the mystery of Christ in us. Christ in us. The first great mystery is God was manifest. The, the giant mystery with that is that Christ is in us. Praise God. So how do we, how will the church manifest Christ? Well, I, I think, if you remember the Matrix movies, who remembers the Matrix movies, the great one? Do you remember there's a choice, isn't it? You take the red pill or the blue pill, okay? You take this pill, you wake up. You take that pill, you go back into la la la, and in the fantasy. And the gospel offers us the truth, okay? And the truth can be painful at times, but the truth sets us free. Praise God. It's, it's revelation of the truth that causes us to grow. It's the church growing up in love. It's having fivefold ministry that causes the church to grow. A revealing of the mysteries of the kingdom to the church causes the church to grow up. Okay, now we showed some videos there. Isn't it? That's awesome, isn't it? Do you know when, when Paul and his team went out and preached the gospel in the ancient world, they lived that in extreme. To the point where people said, the gods have come down from heaven. They were manifested Christ so much that people looked at them and said, the gods have come down from heaven. Wow! You know, Paul didn't allow them to worship him, did he? Of course not. I say to somebody who in the market on Friday, we didn't catch this bit on camera, that lady from Romania with a broken wrist, she's in a lot of pain, we'll lay hands on her. Her husband was like, what's going on here? So I okay, we're not hurting her. And she got completely healed. And she started going like this, she went, are you real, are you real? <laughs> and she was shocked, she was crying. I'm like, well, yeah, yeah, that's my wife. And I just said, look, I'm, which is the body of Christ? That blew me away, that, because I'm under no illusions about, you know, I mean, you know, that's my wife. But I tell you what, I'm a, I'm a son of God. You're a son of God. You're a son of God. We're manifest sons of God. Okay, we're all ashamed of that, yeah? Because if you speak like that, people say, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's the truth. We're manifesting the sonship of Christ. How does the church do this? 1 Peter 1 20. Let's see if I can get this in. It says this, ah, oh, if we can get this, Lord, help us get this up the stairs. It says, Jesus indeed was all ordained before the foundation of the world, but manifest in these last times for you. Okay? So in these last times, Jesus was manifest. The last days began when Jesus came into the world. Oh, we're in the last days. We've been in the last days for 2,000 years. Okay? The last days, Jesus was manifest in these last days. It says in Galatians 1.3 that Jesus gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age. The word age is eon. We have been delivered from the old age. We're in the last days. The new age is coming in. It's coming through us. It's coming in. Praise God. In these last days, God has spoken by His Son, Hebrews 1 2. So Jesus was foreordained to be manifest in these last days. 1 Peter 1 18 to 20, we'll back up a few verses from that. It says that you, this is speaking to us as Christians, you have not been redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from the useless traditions from your forefathers. 
For you have been redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He, Jesus, was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last days for you. He was manifested to redeem us. He was manifested to show the invisible God. And he was manifested at the cross. He manifested at the cross to redeem us through his blood. So that Romans 8 29 says, For whom, this is us, he foreknew. He foreknew. God, he was foreordained. Jesus was foreordained to be manifested in these last days. God foreknew us. We have been foreordained. You have been foreordained to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Jesus was foreordained to be manifested in these last days. Through the cross, after the cross, you have been foreordained to be manifest in these last days. Be conformed to the image of the Son. Why were you not born in 300 BC? You were born in AD after the cross because God, for some reason, purpose, He foreordained that you would be conformed to the image of His Son, i.e. you would be the same as Him. He was foreordained to be manifested in these last days. In this period of history, this dispensation from the cross onwards, you have been foreordained to be manifest as well. Praise God. You just have to say that. How have you been, how have you been foreordained to be manifest, foreknown, predestined, foreordained? It's all the same thing. How have you been foreordained to be manifest in these last days? Because you've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. So when we get back to the cross, the power of the blood of Jesus, that brings us about in our new creation identity and that is when manifestation of the Spirit of God. That's why it says in Revelation 1, 5 to 6, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings, has made us kings, has made us kings and priests. To his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. It's by the blood. By the blood. It's when we're set free from the useless traditions inherited from our forefathers. So stay away from all stupid nonsense about generational curses and all this identification of stuff from your past and healing. No, it's when we see that at the cross you were put to death, you're in Christ. Everything about the old you has been executed, put to death. And just as he was foreordained and being manifested, when you got saved, you got united with him in his death, burial, resurrection. You have been foreordained to be manifested. You and Christ are one. You are one with the Father. You and the Father are absolutely one. Praise God. Praise God. And it shall come to pass in these last days. In these last days, and now I've got a new creation of people who are one with my son through the cross. Now I have a people who are one with me, the Father, as Jesus is one with the Father. Boom! I'm going to pour out my spirit upon them. I'm going to pour forth rivers of living water through them. They are manifesting. Awesome, isn't it? Awesome, isn't it? I mean, this is how the early church took over the world. They talk over the world. This is not kind of fantasy talk. Guys, I mean, I just stop and think, man. You know, where it just takes a bunch of us, you know, to go and raise someone from the dead. That's it. In Jesus' name. You've got a spirit of God in you. And you know what? Uh, this is what I believe we're going to be looking at in the next few weeks. I wouldn't say this is the only barrier, because that's negative. But when we get our wounded souls healed, when we get our wounded souls and, our, and we know our identity, 
then Spirit of God in you, you're going to be a volcano. Amen. You're going to, everybody where you work is going to know about you. You're basically Christ on earth, man. There's a guy that Tom Scarella told me about, and um, he's called Charles Enderfon. I posted one of his videos on my uh, wall. And he was preaching in Outer Mongolia. Okay? He's an African man. And he, he moves in extraordinary power, preaches the gospel in word, powerfully, and thousands of people get saved, backs it up with saints, wonders following. And you get very few black people in Outer Mongolia. Okay? And there was that much happening. The Buddhists were begging to get into the stadium. They couldn't fit everybody in. And news started spreading about, he said, about the country that Jesus has returned as a black man. Yeah, that was true. So people, oh, Jesus, the Christian God, Jesus, has returned as a black man. I mean, you couldn't come to any other conclusion, could you? You know, blessing is a man of God, he went, no, I'm not Jesus Christ, I'm one with him, and I'm his ambassador. I preach the gospel. I mean, we're going to touch this city and this nation and the nations of the world. We're not going to go. Are you real? Are you real? Do you know what I love about that? It's just like, man, what I've got, you can have. <laughs> Join. <laughs> it's awesome. I remember being in a cancer ward in Dar es Salaam. We saw whole walls full of people getting healed and delivered, getting saved. And one Muslim lady got healed. And through the translator, just said, when Jesus went to the cross, paid for everybody's sickness, you lay hands on people, commanded to go, do you understand? Yes. Well, get on with it then. And she did. <laughs> and this is what he said, you get them healed, and then you tell them Jesus died for them, Ask them if they want to receive Jesus. I went, and she got on with it. Guys, this is like the greatest secret in the whole universe, isn't it? I'm finishing here. This is like the best kept secret ever. It's a mystery. Great is the mystery of Godliness. God manifested himself. Great is the mystery of Godliness. God is in you and wants to manifest himself. That's it. This is the greatest secret ever. All we have to do is let God out of the box. But we've got hundreds of years of traditions that have undone the power of the Word of God over all the lies, all the religion. That's the only thing. It's come along and said, no, God is not in you. No, you're not this. No, you're not that. No, you're still under condemnation. All we do is throw all that junk off and be a body of people who manifest it. Awesome.